Thank you very much. Um, I'm an I.O. guy from Yale working on structural estimation, um, especially in dynamic models as applied to industry dynamics. Uh, so what do I have to say about AI? Uh, why am I here? Well, you'll see soon. Um, once upon a time, classical board games like chess, shiogi, which is Japanese chess, and Go were thought to be too complicated for machines. But in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue defeated the world champion of chess. In 2007, a machine learning based program called Bonanza challenged the Ryuo champion, uh, one of the top two title holders, and got beaten up. But then 10 years later, last year, uh, one of its successors called Ponanza then uh, won two straight games from another champion, Saru. And final, uh, finally, by now everyone's familiar with the game of Go. Um, AlphaGo was brutal, beating the European champion, Korean champion, and the world's best player uh, in China. So humans are like, OK, we got beaten up. Like, completely. <laughs> but then there are complaints that these things, things look too black boxy, we don't know, we can't interpret, we can't explain. And today's slides are my uh, attempt to explain the whole thing as what we know much better, like structural models and their estimation. So today I look at these three famous game AIs in the past 20 years. I picked this category because board games represent an archetypical uh, intelligent tasks that was supposed to require human intelligence. Uh, they are also uh, well-defined uh, well -defined problems for which economic interpretations are more natural than for uh, image recognition or natural language processing. I mean, we don't have clear theory about maybe word sequencing or processing pixels but we do have theory and methods for uh, dynamic programming and dynamic games. And it turns out that many of the AI components have their conceptual counterparts in economics. In fact, I found that the algorithms to develop Bonanza, the Shogi AI, and Go are mathematically equivalent to standard methods for estimating dynamic structural models. So that's my uh, main point today. Uh, before jumping into the AIs, let's get notations straight. Uh, chess, Shiogi, and Go belong to the same class of games where you have two players, discrete time, alternating moves, perfect information, and deterministic state transition, like the next state of the board, ST plus one, is completely determined by, sorry, sorry this, is, this must be equal sign completely determined by the current state and current action A. The action space uh, script A is finite because there are only so many legal moves that you are allowed to take. The state space is also finite, consisting of continuation, winning, loss, or draw. The payoffs are zero until uh, someone wins or loses. So it's a zero sum game. Now, all this means that, in principle, this kind of model can be solved backward from terminal states. And should, we should be able to find the unique uh, subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. But in practice, even today's computers can't solve these problems within our lifetime because the state space is huge. For chess, it's 10 to the 47. For shogi, it's 10 to 71. And for go, it's 10 to 171. And the number of atoms in the universe is, well, according to Wikipedia, or according to our speaker at lunchtime talk, it's in that order. And for your information, I've done some research on hard drive industry, and the world's humanity's storage capacity is in the order of 10 to the 20 bytes or so. So we have to make some quick, dirty ways to make programs practical. So case study number one, uh, Deep Blue. Deep Blue has three software components. The first element is evaluation function 
to quantify how good or bad the current state is. It's a parametric value function with 8,000 parameters and 8,000 variables to characterize the state of the game, like the like material value, one point for pawn, three or so points for knight, and say one billion points for a king. The IBM team manually adjusted these 8,150 parameters. Okay. That's crazy. crazy. <laughs> the second element is a search algorithm. Uh, which is a procedure to find the best next move as a function of current state and the evaluation function. Uh, Deep Blue evaluates almost every possible board configuration, but within a finite number of turns, because you can't solve the whole game. That's just too large. Assuming that the opponent chooses, uh, shares the same evaluation at the end, and would mechanically choose a move that would minimize my chance of winning or my value. The third component is databases for end game, which uh, kept compiles the exact solution at the end of the game, and opening book, which is a collection of expert knowledge about what's, what's supposed to be good opening strategies. So, by now, it should be clear that Deep Blue is a calibrated value function. I mean, the manual choice of parameters, not based on the data or econometrics. So to be precise, Deep Blue is a calibrated approximate terminal value function in a game that the program plays against itself, like doppelganger. So that was Deep Blue 20 years ago. Uh, case study number two, Bonanza for Shogi. Here's the story. Professor Kunihito Hoki, an academic chemist, then at the University of Toronto, coincidentally, uh, spent his spare time developing a computer program to play shogi. And the next year, he won the world championship in computer shogi. So there must be something wrong with Toronto. Okay. <laughs> now, the, uh, he revolutionized the computer shogi programs by introducing machine learning like data-driven way to come up with the parameter values. The way he resorted to estimation instead of calibration is because he got 50 million parameters. And the main reason is shogi is more complicated than chess. That's because uh, in chess, captured pieces are dead, but in shogi, pieces never die. They get captured and can be redeployed on the enemy side. And that complicates the state space. So the first element is uh, the evaluation function. Like before, uh, he came up with some nice flexible functional form to capture the board space. The data set comes from 50,000 professional games. So it's about 5 million observations of state on the right-hand side and action on the left-hand side. The way he estimated this evaluation function is pretty interesting. For a given vector of parameter values, you can attach the corresponding terminal value functions at the end of the truncated game tree. You can move backward to solve this truncated game tree to come up with the optimal predicted move, A, T star, say. Now, you can repeat the whole procedure until you find the parameter values that would best rationalize the actual moves taken by the human professionals. So now things start looking more like an I.O. paper. <laughs> so I'd say Bonanza is a Harold Zucker, if you're familiar with it. It's literally the same algorithm as Rust 87, which is this econometrica paper. Rust method has two optimization routines that are nested. Uh, first, the outer loop is to find the parameter values of the value function or utility fun function that's underlying it. The nested subroutine is, takes those parameter values as given, solves the dynamic programming problem, and turns out the optimal actions. And you repeat this until you find parameter values that would best rationalize the observed actions. Sounds complicated, but it's the usual revealed uh, preferences principle. So I told this whole story to John Rust last year, and he seemed pretty happy that Japanese programmers came up with Rust 87-ish algorithm <laughs> and defeated 
the, computer, uh, the human champions. And so that was Bonanza 10 years ago, or John Rust 30 years ago. Uh, case study number three, uh, now go. Uh, a little bit of background before we get to AlphaGo. The AIs for chess and shogi uh, came up with some nice parameterization of the state space, script S. But doing so go was pretty difficult because, well, the board is bigger, there are more legal moves, but the worst part is experts couldn't really articulate what makes good states uh, good. Like they talk about beautiful patterns or like a cloudy patterns or something like that. <laughs> that means you can't codify that. So developers gave up on that, the construction of evaluation function or parameterization of state space about 12 years ago. And then they resorted to a brute force numerical approach. Start from any state, like current state, fill in the board randomly until the end of the game when the board is filled by stones. Uh, repeat this play out many times, like many, many times. That's gonna give a sense of the probability of winning or losing from starting from that current state. And choose the best move that would lead to the best winning uh, state. And this algorithm could beat amateurs but not professionals. Uh, that, that was the, the, the previous effort before AlphaGo came along. And now AlphaGo had many components, four of them, and I'll talk about them. Uh, I, I'll talk about each of them. The first component is a policy network, which predicts professional players' moves, like actions A, as a function of current state ST. So it's a policy function with about five million parameters. The specification consists of 48 variables, 13 layers, 192 filters, with lots of logit-like calculations in between. I don't go into the details, but the output is actually the predicted choice probabilities, literally the logit choice probability style. This part of AlphaGo um, use the, the data of professional players, which had about 256 million action state pairs, as like a training set, and use supervised, uh, supervised learning with maximum likelihood. This part of AlphaGo is the same as Hotz-Miller 93, who proposed a two-step estimation approach that sidesteps the solution of dynamic programming problems. Uh, that is, you can look at the data on actions and states, actions and states, to estimate the policy function, ideally uh, non-parametrically, or conditional choice probabilities, and that's their first stage. And that's exactly how the supervised learning policy network is constructed. So that's component one. Component two of AlphaGo is then reinforcement learning because the goal of DeepMind, the team, is not to estimate an empirical model of human Go players, but rather their goal was to create a Terminator pr uh, program to beat humans. So starting from the actual estimated policy function, uh, they iterated to find uh, some perturbed strategies or perturbed parameters, uh, simulate lots of games between these programs, and favor altered parameters that would lead to more wins. Slowly they found some better strategies than what's estimated from the data. So this, is, this part is like a counterfactual experiment in which you, you know, capture a bunch of East Asian Go players, put them into concentration camp, and make them live forever, beating each other, so that they would come up with some better strategies or a more slightly, slightly more peaceful or technical way of saying that is it's a policy function iteration. <laughs> to approximate the optimal strategy that's known to exist, although we can't really find the, the exact one. So I think that kind of setup really helped. 
Uh, in principle, that reinforcement learned policy network or policy function should be able to beat any humans if it works well. But the development team moved on to construct the th third component anyway, a value network. Here's what they did. One, simulate many games by letting the policy functions play against each other. Uh, step two, these simulations generate data of many games and the identity of the winner and loser. Step three, Uh, these synthetic data can be then used to train a new model that pr to predict the winning probability as a function of the current state. Uh, this new model uses another flexible functional form, the deep convolutional neural network, with the similar design, 49 variables, 15 la layers, 192 filters. So it's a value function that is a function of the current state and that spits out the probability of winning given the parametric specification under the maintained high assumption that my own strategy is the same as the opponent's strategy which is the same as the estimated or trained strategy. The reason this method worked is the following. The optimal strategy or optimal policy and optimal value functions are duals. They both represent the solution to the same dynamic programming problem. Hotzmiller 93 proposed matrix inversion to invert policy for value, but that was kind of a messy. So the next year, Hotzmiller, Sanderson, Smith 94 proposed the use of forward simulations to numerically sort of invert the policy function to get value or underlying parameters. And that's how this value network is being constructed. The fourth component is less novel, the, the same Monte Carlo tree search, the, the thing people used since 2006. So that's AlphaGo two years ago, or Hotzmiller, maybe about 25 years ago. So here's the summary of my three case studies of or my main task of clarifying the mapping between these game AIs and the econometric methods for uh, working on dynamic structural models. Uh, to, to conclude, I'd like to comment on three interesting issues. One is implicit assumptions throughout. There are many assumptions going behind uh, these uh, game AIs like our usual IID logit errors associated with each of the discrete choices, like this move or that move. Of course, once we recognize this implicit assumption, we can make them explicit and think about their implications, like the, how, how we capture or not capture the true data generating process. Even in this highly abstract board games, there are lots of nuances in real professionals' games. Players are pl pretty heterogeneous, cross-sectionally or intertemporally. They also interact strategically like crazy. And there are also many real-world constraints, like time constraints and physical constraints, that are, for now, not incorporated in the, in the model. And this heterogeneity and real-world constraints are probably more interesting part for economic study. And that's not just gonna be good for economic research. I think that's, all, that's gonna be also good for developing certain types of AIs. Clear modeling would lead to clear interpretations or explanations. Making implicit assumptions explicit would tell us or make us understand what AIs, particular AIs, do or do not. And relaxing some of these assumptions with more recent techniques would allow us to capture more reality. And if, if we want, we can make those AIs more human-like by capturing those more reality. So my take-home message from comparing these uh, econometric methods and game AIs is that Economists are probably in a very good position to provide discipline 
to these, all these efforts to interpret and explain AIs from the messy results of data analysis. Of course, we can bring disciplines to ad hoc data analysis, ad hoc decision making, or ad hoc explanations. So that is economics of AI and also economics for AI. Uh, thank you very much. All right, so happy to be here to uh, talk about this paper and enjoy the interesting conference. Um, this, uh, I want to just briefly summarize uh, what, what uh, Suri talked about. So he just, as he talked about, uh, you know, this, these uh, methods have achieved a really good performance for uh, these three games, uh, which is very impressive. And each of those is an alternating player, two-player discrete choice game with a binary outcome, win or lose. And the econometric methods each used remarkably. Deep Blue uh, was uh, constructed by uh, grandmasters getting together and picking the parameters. Okay, so it's impressive. And then uh, Bonanza moved to using uh, the Rust type approach to, to uh, get a value function estimate, which was then used in, in uh, making the choices about what uh, moves to make. And then AlphaGo uh, is deep neural net version of estimating the conditional choice probabilities. And then using uh, simulation to back out the value function uh, from those conditional choice probabilities. Um, and then use that in uh, determining the moves. So I want to make a few comments and given my background, I um, want to talk a little bit about the econometrics involved in this and, and, and been thinking about it and wanted to raise some questions. Uh, so I think as people have mentioned in comments here, machine learning is good at prediction and that's what it's really been designed for, uh, for prediction, for predicting outcomes using regressors. Most commonly perhaps is regression. And actually the, you know, the conditional choice probabilities, those are, those are basically regressions, discrete regressions. You know, I have a discrete dependent variable, but uh, you're trying to estimate the conditional probability of a choice. So those are not necessarily good for estimating objects you're interested in, okay? And in particular, it seems remarkable how well this does in producing good decisions about what move to make. Um, you wouldn't actually expect that necessarily from the econometrics of, the, of this. Once you push on to say uh, that what we're estimating is the value function rather than uh, what the prediction is. So, so that's interesting in and of itself. Um, you, you're able, it's not clear how well you're estimating the optimal value function. We don't know what it is, but at least you do good enough that you can beat any human person, right? <laughs> so that's impressive, okay? Uh, so let me talk a little bit about prediction versus estimation and what the issue is and uh, a little bit about how that can be resolved in some cases at least. Um, so good predictions are inherently biased. Good predictions are designed to minimize goodness of fit which you know means you want to minimize variance and and bias, and so what they tend to do is they tend to set standard deviation equal to bias, and so you know if there's a lot of noise, um, inherently you can end up with a lot of bias as well. So in estimation, um, there's been a number of recent papers over the last three or four or five years about how to debias those. So I just wanted to talk briefly about that. To, to show that this can be a problem and then it can be fixed and then to come, I'll come back to the uh, machine learning, I mean to the, um, the uh, what Mitsuri talked about. Okay, so I'm going to give graphs for the average treatment effect and I'm sort of assuming that I'm not going to explain what that is. <laughs> I'm assuming pretty much everybody uh, in this group knows and 
these graphs are from a recent paper, but you know they mimic or they look like graphs that have been around for uh, some time, actually. Okay, and here's some papers where these kind of graphs show up. Okay, so we're going to estimate the average treatment effect, and what we're what we're going to do is we're going to regress. We're going to regress um, the variable, the outcome variable, on the covariates and on the treatment, and then use that, the usual, okay, and we're going to do that by, in this case, in this graph, it's lasso, okay? So we're using a lasso regression to estimate that, and then construct the average treatment effect in the usual way from that lasso estimate, and it's biased, okay? Um, many of you have seen graphs like this before, I'm sure, so, but this just illustrates the fact that, that the machine learning uh, doesn't necessarily produce a good estimate of the thing you're interested in, okay? And uh, the naive approach here, we just use the machine learning estimate and construct the average treatment effect in the usual way. Okay, now if you debias this, and I'll get to that in a minute, it looks like this. So, it can be taken care of, particularly for things like the average treatment effect, it can be taken care of. Okay, so there's a straightforward, general, statistically good way to do this. It has all the nice uniformity properties in spite of the model selection going on. It works great. Um, um, uh, uh, that can be applied in some settings, and including the average treatment effect. For, so for parameters that are averages, for things... Uh, that includes the parameters of a discrete choice model. They're not literally averages, but they're kind of, uh, you know, under certain conditions, there are things that are really inconsistently estimable, and so they behave like averages. Um, and a simple way, this is general and can apply to uh, uh, lots of different things. In the context of GMM estimation, you can construct debiased moments by taking whatever your identifying moments are and adding something to them, which is uh, essentially the influence function of the, the moments themselves. And there's a, there's a good uh, long history of this in, a, in statistics that has sort of built up to the completely general thing we have at the moment. Okay, and you can even... Uh, it looks like maybe that second thing is complicated. It turns out you can automate that and do a bias correction that kind of automatically gets rid of that, at least for some cases, uh, at, at least gets rid of this problem in some cases. Okay, so, all right, so, so now go back, right? I mean, that sounds like what was done. <laughs> Right, you use machine learning, you estimate these choice probabilities, you go back and, and construct the value function. So one question I have from my perspective is why did it work so well? Um, it's possible that they did some debiasing along the way, and I don't know, actually. So some, perhaps some form of debiasing is implicit in the way the decision rules are estimated. And maybe because you're estimating a value function, something good happens that, you know, maybe the bias in estimating the choice probabilities is not so important. I'm not, I'm not sure uh, about that. In estimating parameters of a discrete choice model using machine learning as a first step, it does matter, actually. I have um, some results on that. Um, the other possibility, you know, the other possibility, maybe there's some structure here, as I said. Maybe it's on, the other possibility is maybe there's some undersmoothing going on. And what that means is you would estimate the best model for prediction and then make it richer in some way uh, that, that sort of hopefully is related to what you're interested in. Uh, we don't know how to do that yet. I mean, that's kind of in things that are, people are working on, actually. Um, but uh, maybe that's what they did, actually, to get this to work. Or maybe the bias just doesn't matter. Maybe, in fact, um, you know, you didn't have to have that good of an estimate of the optimal value function to beat humans, right? Which is always possible, right? Because this, this thing can calculate much better than any of us can. So maybe you just didn't need to have that good of an estimate. Um, these interpretations that Mitsuri talked about are quite interesting and I think raise a bunch of interesting questions. 
Um, these are questions maybe I want to ask myself, <laughs> uh, some of them, because they're econometrics things, but uh, I think they're interesting. You know, it's, it, it provides hope for doing structural estimation. The type of models we estimate generally don't have this kind of dimensionality, even if we have a lot of state variables. Um, you know, we're not dealing with those big problems, I don't think. It raises more speculative questions, like uh, maybe the structural methods are too good. I mean, you can beat people using this. <laughs> so maybe people aren't behaving according to this model, that means, so maybe these are too good. Um, um, and then, I just in summary, the paper's interpretation of success of the three games is excellent and raises lots of interesting questions.